Well, tonight we're going to be talking on Jehovah's Witnesses and the real Jesus and discussing the most important of all questions, who really is Jesus Christ? And when we are talking to people from the Watchtower, how do we get around to the real Jesus? And how do we, most important of all, present the gospel to these people? So we're going to be concentrating on that and also, hopefully, in the area of meeting Jehovah's Witnesses ministry. The importance of the person of Jesus Christ when dealing with the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society cannot be minimized. You can waste an enormous amount of time discussing with Jehovah's Witnesses whether or not the soul of man is mortal or immortal. You can argue with them ad infinitum, ad nauseum about their prophetic structures and go round and round and round as Mr. Setnar obviously has demonstrated and as others proficient in this field also can document. You can waste a great deal of time discussing whether or not hell is the grave or a place of rest in hope until the resurrection. You can argue about blood transfusion and why they won't take it and the American flag, why they won't salute it. You can lose yourself in dialogue with the average Jehovah's Witness on what must be classified as peripheral theology and never ever penetrate to the core of the problem. Therefore, let us make a differentiation between central theology and peripheral theology. Peripheral theology is that which has no real impact upon the destiny of the soul or the life that is lived. You can debate it, in fact, and continue to debate it, generating heat and very little light, and never really accomplish anything. But the central theology of the Christian faith revolves around one word, Christology. This is the person, nature, and work of Jesus Christ. Christology is the hub of the wheel from which all the spokes of doctrine radiate. And the rim that holds it together is the authority of the Scriptures. When you are dealing with the Jehovah's Witness, you must remember that the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in the authority of the Scriptures. That is a definite plus, as opposed to, say, the Christian scientists or the Baha'is who pay lip service to the Bible but will not say that it is the infallible Word of God. When you are dealing with a Jehovah's Witness, that is Watchtower theology. The Bible is the Word of God. They maintain it is the Supreme Court of Appeals and teach their people that they should appeal to the Bible. That gives us a very definite cutting edge because if the Christian is familiar with biblical Christology, who Jesus Christ is, what he came to do, what this really means in terms of redemption and the life to be lived, then it's possible to give an effective witness to a Jehovah's Witness. Now what frequently happens when a Jehovah's Witness comes to the door is that the Christian becomes somewhat flustered because of a psychology which has been generated through many years of misunderstanding. The Christian must think of the Jehovah's Witness, not as some super being, but as an individual soul, the object of Christ's love and salvation. They don't have any whiz-kid approach to evangelism, and they have very few answers. They are programmed by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in Brooklyn and taught at their kingdom halls and in their various services what to say right down to the language to be used. In other words, you are dealing with the classic stereotype, word-for-word -word sales presentation of Watchtower theology. You've got to communicate to the Jehovah's Witness when you are talking to the Jehovah's Witness that the real object of your concern is the Watchtower Society that has misled them. You are not attacking them. You are 
criticizing the theology of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. If once you attack Jehovah's Witnesses as a body and make it personal, you might as well forever abandon any hope of getting through to the person you are trying to witness to. They will go on the defensive and they will defend themselves and the watchtower to the death. Now, psychologically, nothing irritates people more than to arrive at the conclusion that they have been had, that they have been conned, that somewhere along the line, with all their sincerity and dedication, somebody has made merchandise of them. Time and again, in dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, I have seen devout members of the Watchtower Society suddenly, on their own, come to the conclusion, Hey, I did get that idea from the Watchtower. And it doesn't square with the Bible. And then they start writing letters and asking questions. Ted Densher is one of the most famous ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Ted has written a number of books. Chris crosses the country and has led thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses out of the Watchtower to Jesus Christ. Ted came to Christ by coming in one night dead tired to a Philadelphia Kingdom Hall and there finding a copy of my book, Jehovah of the Watchtower, sitting in the Kingdom Hall on a table. And some zealous Christian had said to a Jehovah's Witness, I don't know any of the answers, but he does. <laughs> Read it. And they took it, brought it to the Kingdom Hall, and put it down. Ted came in, opened it up, read the first chapter, threw the book across the room, and said, the man is nuts. I'm not going to listen to that stuff. And something bothered him. Something I wrote. Supposing, just supposing, you are really sincere, really dedicated, really right on in what you are doing, and you are wrong because somebody has misled you with the wrong information. Do you want to spend eternity in hell for somebody else's mistake? And he found himself saying, no, not at all. He got up and went over and picked up the book again. And he read through it. He read it five times. Then he sat down and drafted a nasty letter to me. He decided instead of being angry at me, he would instead first ask the watchtower for the right answers so he could write me and give me the answers. So he wrote down all the questions I had raised in the book and sent them to the watchtower's headquarters. And they sent him a lovely letter explaining absolutely nothing. And he was a devout Jehovah's Witness, one of their top men in Philadelphia for more than seven years. And he wrote them again and said, look, I'm one of the family. Please answer the question. The main question I've got is, who's Jesus? And they wrote back, see page such and such, see page such and such, see page such and such. And he wrote them again. I have seen page such and such, but I've also been checking these references in the Bible. And page such and such doesn't make any sense anymore. Please answer my question. And they gave up writing him. And because they couldn't answer him on the one vital question of the ages. Who is the real Jesus? A seven-year dyed-in-the-wool Jehovah's Witness fell to his knees in his room and cried out this prayer. Oh, Lord, I don't know how it's true. But I know it. Jesus is Jehovah God. Save me. He got up off his knees and he didn't know anything else, but he was born again. <laughs> and he went out to become a witness for Christ. And today God has raised him up into a great ministry to the Jehovah's Witnesses. He did it because of the question I want to direct your attention to tonight. The identity of Jesus of Nazareth. Who he is. The real Jesus. When you are talking to a Jehovah's Witness that has come into your living room, please keep in mind 
that in his mind, psychologically and linguistically, the word Jehovah means only one thing, Father. So if you say to a Jehovah's Witness, I'm going to show you from the Scriptures that Jesus is Jehovah, you have already smashed into the semantic barrier. The Watchtower is successful because it takes all of the verses dealing with the humanity of Christ and neglects all the verses dealing with the divinity of Christ. Since Christ is both God and man, the Watchtower has successfully kept the Jehovah's Witness mind in the rut of his humanity without ever any serious study of the claims of his divinity. How does the Christian counter this? By carefully, subtly, and indirectly suggesting something which really upsets the Jehovah's Witness. Inject into their mind the thought of contradiction. And here's how it can be done. When you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness about who Jesus is, you can begin this way. I know we could discuss all kinds of things, and there's all kinds of interesting things in your theology that we could spend a lot of time on. But really, I'm concerned with only one thing. I want to know who Jesus is. Because if all my theology is right, and I've got the wrong Jesus, I am lost. For all eternity. And the Jehovah's Witness will say, nine times out of ten, well, I, I'm under the impression that there's only one Jesus. And lovingly say, well, you know, I used to think that too. But one day I was reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And in verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul says, it's possible to be deceived by another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. So there's a counterfeit Jesus, counterfeit Holy Spirit, counterfeit gospel. Take in the Second Corinthians chapter 11. There is another Jesus. So let's pursue the real Jesus. First of all, we're going to use a recognized translation of the Bible. We've got to use a recognized one because only recognized translations will give us an accurate picture of the text. Secondly, you say to the Jehovah's Witness, I want to talk about these things honestly and fairly without any outside influence. I don't want to be influenced by my church. I don't want you to be influenced by the watchtower. Fair enough? Right. So you close your briefcase and don't use any of your books or magazines or articles or literature, and I'll close everything I've got and use only the Bible. Doesn't the watchtower teach that the Bible and the Bible alone is the supreme authority? Yes. We'll just close all Watchtower material out and all Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Lutheran, whatever your denominational background, and we'll deal just with the text. Do not make the mistake of circular reasoning. Do not say, I am going to prove to you that Jesus is Jehovah. Begin by saying, let's look for the identity of the real Jesus by studying what the Scripture has to say about him in entirety, not just parts. Now, I happen to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was truly man. I happen to believe that when he was hungry, he was really hungry. When he was thirsty, he was really thirsty. When somebody touched him in a crowd, he turned around and said, Who touched me? Not, You touched me. He said, I don't know the day or the hour of my return. The angels don't know. Only my Father. He said, I am not doing the works that is the Father in me. He is doing the works. I, by my own self, can do nothing. I believe in a truly human Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The last Adam. That's who he was. The Jehovah's Witness is going to beam at you approvingly because you are going to emphasize the humanity of Christ. Now, once we've seen this in its proper perspective, it's possible for us to use the verses the Jehovah's Witnesses would use on us. 
And you continue in this same vein. And you say, I really believe that when Jesus was on earth, he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And I believe that when he said, my father is greater than I, it was true. The father was in a greater position than the son. After all, the son was lower than the angels. I really believe in the humanity of the Lord Jesus. I believe that there are passages in the Bible that really call the Lord Jesus Christ not a God, but truly deity. That he was addressed as deity, as God himself, worshipped as God himself. And I think we ought to look at those because after all, they're important too. Now Jehovah's Witness will say immediately. There are no verses that teach this at all. Now, you've learned this from your religionist background and from the religionist doctrine of the Trinity. Now, this has nothing whatsoever to do with the Bible. You must at that moment say, all I'm interested in is looking at the passages. Can we look together at the passages? Maybe you can explain them to me. I said before, introduce something which really shakes up the watchtower mentality. The word, contradiction. And begin by using some passages which imply contradiction. If the Watchtower's Christology is true. And that contradiction plants the seed for search. To resolve the contradiction because no Jehovah's Witness can live with the idea mentally or emotionally that the Bible contradicts itself. It'll eat him to death. Here's how it can be done. The first chapter of the book of Hebrews, there appears a passage which speaks specifically of the person of our Lord. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. Speaking of the Father, again, when he, the Father, brings in the first begotten to the world, you ask the Jehovah's Witness, who's the first begotten? He will immediately say, Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God. He is the archangel Michael. But he is not God. A God, but not Jehovah God. Well, you see, I've got a problem here. Because Hebrews 1.6 says, When he brings the first begotten into the world, he said, Let all the angels of God worship him. Is that true? The Jehovah's Witness will say, well, I mean, <laughs> well, it does say that. That's right. The Word of God does say that. Jesus was to be worshipped. Right. Now, we have a real problem because if I accept what your view is, if I believe that Jesus was the first and greatest creation of Jehovah God, then I've got to believe in contradiction. Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Christ is tempted by Satan. And in that conflict with the devil, Satan says, All I want you to do is bow down and worship me. The same word translated worship in Luke 4 is identical in Hebrews 1, 6. How do we explain this? When the next verse says, Get thee hence, Satan, it is written, You shall worship only Jehovah, thy God. Him alone shall you serve. How can the Father command the universe to worship the Son, and then the Son quotes the Father as saying, That the only one to be worshipped is Jehovah. That puzzles me. I wonder if you could explain it to me.